You've been very busy over at your booth over there. It's been a big weekend. Been yeah. A big weekend. He's, he's, <laughs> I met Dale earlier this weekend. He's got an amazing story. I know you're going to talk a little bit more about From Seed to Spoon, correct, in your app, and, um, and why you got into gardening in the first place. Tell us a little bit about why you got into gardening, Dale. Yeah, so my wife and I started growing food in 2015 to help with anxiety and depression. Uh, we read a book called The Depression Cure that talked about how we could uh, help manage some of the issues I've dealt with throughout my life through what we ate and you know what we did as far as how much time we spent outside and things like that. And that led to gardening, and uh, and then I got a little obsessed. So a little, yeah. If you haven't seen the website, his very very plain backyard is an oasis of vegetation right now. It's really really cool to see. Um, well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. So what are you going to talk to us about today? We're going to talk about how you can start growing food using our free mobile app. We're going to talk about how to grow uh, as many foods as we can fit in our time we have today. All right, I'll leave you to it. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out. I'm going to do the rest of the presentation down here. Can everyone see me? Yep. Cool. So uh, as you mentioned, my name is Del Spoonmore. Uh, I'm going to start off by showing our backyard here so you can see where we got started from. This is my wife and family here. She's around here somewhere, I think at our booth. Um, this is our backyard. So when I started growing food back in 2015, I knew nothing about gardening, um, but we, we, we started with the square foot gardening method and, and I got obsessed in, in a way, and, and it led to this. So this is what our backyard looks like. Uh, this is 2017. We've since replaced a lot of these raised beds with these smart pots. I've got an updated photo at our booth that has uh, another photo from last year, but, um, Anyway, this is our backyard, and we wanted to make uh, a mobile app to make it easy for other people to do the same thing, because we learned how to do a lot of this through books and through um, classes that I took through the Master Gardener program and through meeting people like Bill Ferris, who's speaking here at 2 o'clock today, and uh, going to all of his classes that he taught and learning as much as I could from him and people like him, and all of that information we wanted to put into an app. Um, but more to that, too, we wanted to make an app to make it simple to do some of the calculations you have to do. So what I mean by that um, is planting dates, for example. So planting dates are different all across the country. Uh, we wanted to make it easy to calculate based on where you live. So if you choose a plant in the app, we'll show you planting dates that are calculated based on your nearest weather station. So we have a database of weather stations from all across the country. We find the ones closest to you. We have the last 100 years of data from that weather station as far as what the freeze dates have been and whatnot. And we use that to calculate the likelihood of the freeze date and then use that to drive the planting dates. So we also show you uh, how to plant it. So this shows you how many per square you plant. Um, if you're not familiar with square foot gardening, it originates from this book here. This is the first gardening book I ever bought and what I started with. And the idea is basically this. Uh, this is a seeding square that makes it easy to visualize this. but. You take your, your garden and you divide it into square feet. And then each square foot has, um, you can plant each square foot individually. So each plant has this measurements as far as how many fit per, per square foot. So banana peppers are one. So this shows you here, you know, one per square. Uh, spinach are nine, carrots are 16. So each plant has its, its measurement and this allows you to plant different than the way you may be accustomed to with like the row gardening. Um, the idea is not that you plant, you know, everything together, you space things around. And the reason for that is, is a couple of reasons really. And the first one is with pest prevention. So pests find what they're looking for through their sense of smell. If you have a whole row of tomatoes, it's really easy for the pest for tomatoes to find the tomato they're looking for. But if you have one tomato and you have a basil plant, oregano plant, maybe beans here and carrots here, it's a lot harder for the tomato pest to find what it's looking for because there's a sense from all these other plants up in the air. And I specifically mentioned basil and oregano because those type of plants, those herbs that have really strong scents, put up a lot of smell up into the air and it really makes it hard for the pest to find them. And plants like basil and oregano specifically really help your other plants grow. Oregano will improve the flavor of tomatoes. So we've got, you know, this is a, a rosemary here. We've got chives here, thyme. We've got a lot of these herbs spread across, across our garden. That's how we get away without having to use any pesticide in our garden, because we rely on things like this, companion planting, beneficial insects, things like that. We have all that in the app, so we'll get to that more here in a second. Um, we also have information in here for time to harvest, so you can see how long it would take to grow uh, banana peppers. That's, uh, that number was pretty generic across all varieties. We actually have a partnership with Burpee, uh, one of the, the largest seed companies in the country, where we pull in all of their 
varieties into the app. And then you can go through and see the specific days of maturity for each of those. So they're pretty similar on sweet peppers, but if you get into like carrots, for example, you've got a really long range of 60 days all the way to 90. So depending on, um, and the reason why that matters, just to touch on that for a second, if you wanted to grow peas right now, it's too late to plant them if, you, if they're the varieties that take um, 80 to 90 days. But if you get one of the 65 to 70 day varieties, you still have a chance of having peas. So that's why you need to care about uh, days of maturity and things like that. Um, sometimes you won't care about days of maturity. It's uh, a watermelon, for example. You're trying to grow the largest watermelon you can. You don't care how long it takes to mature. Um, so that, that's one that you ignore. I, we had a question in the back. Yeah, so the question was about uh, sun and, sh and shade and all that. So we have uh, a section in the app here for sun requirements that shows you what that plant likes. So for banana peppers, it's full sun. For some plants, it'll have a range. So it'll say full sun to part shade. And oftentimes what that means is, so for, for spinach, for example, spinach loves full sun in the spring. Right now, it's great in full sun, but by May, it's going to be too hot for that spinach in full sun and it's going to bolt. So at that point, it's better off. Bolt means it, um, it shoots up a center stalk and goes to seed. It doesn't produce any more leaves. It, it tries to produce seed. And at that point, the leaves taste gross and you don't eat it anymore and it's done. Um, so that's what bolting means. So spinach, if it's planted in an area that gets some shade in the afternoon, won't do that as quickly. It'll still do it eventually in the summer, but you got longer life out of it. So. Um, that's the idea behind the sun requirements in here. We also have uh, watering in here, so it tells you how often you need to water that. Watering is different for every plant. And I wanna use this to lead into showing something that's coming uh, coming next month. So y'all are some of the first people to ever see this. We've been coding this for the past six months, and we're, we're excited to show our new Garden Plus feature that lets you actually log when you plant things. Um, so there's this plus button up here on the top right. I'm gonna tap that I've planted banana peppers. And now you'll see this new interface. So these alerts are fictional here, but it gives you the idea of what we're gonna be giving you. So it'll send you alerts telling you when to water based on how much it's rained where you are, when to fertilize based on what that plant needs and what its requirements are. And, for, and, the, and this, uh, when to fertilize needs to be adjusted too based on how much it's rained. Because if it rains a lot, that'll wash out the nitrogen. You've gotta add more nitrogen back in, depending on the plant. So we're gonna take all that guesswork and all that logic out of your hands and make it where it's really simple because they'll send me push notifications telling you when to do that. And you'll be able to log everything too. So we have the planting date here, and then we can choose the planting method. So if it's a pepper, it's gonna be a transplant. Amount planted, we'll say one. Uh, site, that's where it is. So we'll say it's backyard. Um, eventually we want to have a feature that lets you draw out your garden, and we tell you where things should go. So that's why we have site on there. And then variety, so the type of banana pepper, whether it's yellow or whatever the variety name is. And then you'll see these cards here. So these are the first of many cards to come that will give you estimations of things, of, of, of when things should happen. So this is when that seed should, should sprout if you plant today. That's when, so, so you know, so for carrots, for example, um, it, it, it could take up, up to 20 days for them to sprout. And if you're in the first seven days, you think something went wrong. And this, you know, this helps you out with that. Um, also the projected first harvest that shows you when the harvest window should open. Now this is not accurate for banana peppers because you can't plant them right now. I probably shouldn't have used this as an example. I just tapped a random thing. But you get the idea. We're projecting out what it should be. And we'll have more things in there. We're going to continue to grow this. This is really where I think we're excited about is innovating in this area. Um, we also have a plant log so you can come in here and you can add events. So we're going to add some events for you automatically. So whenever it rains, we're gonna add in that event automatically. We're not doing it yet, but this is what we're gonna be doing when it's released. And then we have, uh, you can add other events too. So if you spot a pest or if you fertilized or anything like that, you can log it here. So it makes it easy to keep track of that. And, and really more importantly, it lets you go back at the end of the season. So if you had a problem, you can, note, you can look at what you did, and it helps you analyze what may have gone wrong, or if you're developing a problem, you can see what's going on. Um, and then the next year, um, you can so you can archive the plant when it's done. The next year, you can go back and look at your archive and see what variety did I grow, what did I do, what went well. You can keep notes and all that kind of stuff. And with that idea in mind, you can keep photo notes. So you can come in here, you can keep text notes there, 
But you can also take a photo. So for this rosemary here, I can take a photo of it. And then I can make a note about what's going on with this photo. So whatever I want to type there, I'm just going to type test. It's hard to think of things when I'm up here. And, uh, and that's all there is to it. And then you can save it. And then you can do that you know, all throughout the growing. So you can go back and reference them and see, um, especially for kids, they love this. So when you're getting your kids interested in growing, this is a really easy way to get their attention focused because they love devices, they love things like this. And then it gets them to place to organize it and catalog it. My daughter loves this side of it. So that's coming uh, with over the next couple months. So if you want to sign up to test this out, to help us out, um, go to our website and sign up for our email list. We're going to be sending out uh, things about how you can sign up for that over the next few weeks. So we're looking for people to help us test it and make sure that everything is, is as it should be. And part of that is also going to be this new weather tab that is not currently in the app that is live, but this is going to be coming out. And this is meant to be uh, what we believe to be the first weather weather app that's focused on gardening information. And what I mean by that is providing things like the amount of time that it's been below 50 degrees, the amount of time it's been above 90 degrees. Um, and the reason why things like that matter is because that's what's gonna drive our predictive planting technology that's coming that's gonna tell you when to plant, not just on what's happened the past 100 years, but what's happening right now. So we can use that data to know that it's still below 50 degrees outside, don't plant your tomatoes. So, or um, it's, what we have alerts set up so that if it's going to be freezing, you'll get an alert in there up to seven days in advance saying it's going to freeze in seven days, start making your preparations now. Or if it's going to be above 90 degrees, it's going to be really hot coming up, make sure your plants have water. It's going to help you in your efforts to grow food and make it to where you don't have to think about it anymore, it'll hold your hand through it. So that was our vision when we launched this app and we're really excited to, to release that this year. Um, and we feel like it's really going to make it to where you don't have to think about gardening. But the version of the app that's out now, I'm going to go back to that now. So everything I'm showing you from here on out, you can download now on iPhone or on Android, or you can use on our website. It's all completely free. Um, and it will give you the information you need. So we have all the information that's driving everything that's coming in here already. We're going to give you that information. And then the software that's coming is what will walk you through it. So in here, we have the information, too, about how to plant each vegetable or, or, or fruit or herb. So in here, we have the planting method. Uh, some plants, um, most plants in Oklahoma can be planted directly from seed in the ground. It's that simple here in Oklahoma. Some things need to be transplanted. Uh, the reason for that mostly uh, boils down to it takes more time. So for cabbage and tomatoes and peppers, if you started seeds outdoors, it would get too hot before they could produce. So you've got to start them indoors. Um, but other than that, most everything else can be started by seed directly outdoors. This will tell you that here. It'll also tell you how uh, deep to plant each seed and how many days it takes to sprout, as well as how, how tall it gets. Again, all of this comes into helping you plan, and this is what's gonna go into the software that's coming that helps you know, uh, so the, the height matters because plants shouldn't be shaded by other plants. We gotta calculate that kind of stuff. So we also have information in here about how to use the plants that you grow. So um, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at growing stuff, and my wife has gotten really good at figuring out how to make it all taste good. She's going to back carry back here. And this is, uh, this is all from her. So this is about, first, you know, how we harvest the plants, because it does matter when you harvest and how you harvest them. Um, but also how, how you cook and how you preserve them. We have a lot of that information in here as well, um, how you can save seeds from them. And then we also have links to products that we use in our garden here, on both Amazon and in our partnership with Burpee. Um, and we also have discount codes with Burpee uh, where you can, you can get discounts on their products exclusively through us. So moving to some of these other tabs that we have in the app at the very top, we have this friends tab, and this will show you all the plants that grow well next to each plant. So you can come through and see, so if you want to plant banana peppers, here's all the things you can plant around it, and it's safe to do so. And then the same idea, these are all the things you should not plant anywhere near, but, uh, but uh, yeah. So, so that makes it easy to go through and plan out your garden and to know what should go where whenever you're planting. Uh, we also have a pest tab that shows you all the pests that attack each vegetable. And then if you tap on the pest, we'll show you how we treat them in our garden. Again, without using any pesticides. We do have some natural sprays. Uh, again, these are not pesticides. It's like a soap or some sort of natural base solution. And we also have, um, usually what we try and do is figure out natural solutions to handle pests without having to spray or do anything. And that usually relies on finding the bugs that like to eat those bad bugs and figuring out how to get them into our garden. Sometimes that's through planting the plants that they like, 
or it's through giving them a certain type of shelter they like. Um, uh, then, and also, uh, sometimes it comes down to just understanding how you can use creatures that sometimes are viewed as bad as good. A couple examples of those are cats and birds. You can keep cats out of your garden with a motion activated sprinkler, and they'll keep pests you know, like mice out of your garden. So they'll help you out, and you can keep them out of your gardens with those motion activated sprinklers. Um, you can also make traps for cucumber beetles, homemade traps using yellow solo cups and glue. There's all sorts of things like that that we found or come up with that we've included in the app. So we don't have any pesticides in here. Um, so we let's go back to the plant list now. Uh, now that you see how it works for each plant, let's talk about how you know what plants to start with. Because you've got 100 plants in the app, and it's a very overwhelming landscape when you first come into gardening of what do I start with, what do I grow. For us, we wanted to start growing food because we wanted to help with, uh, with my anxiety and depression. I tried medication, I tried all sorts of things, I didn't like any of it. And um, gardening for me, I read a book called The Depression Cure that talked about how uh, growing food and spending time outside and drinking a lot of water could help with these issues. And we went all in, and my wife's a nurse, and she helped support me through this, and we started logging everything we ate and everything we did, and pretty quickly we discovered that this helped. So that's why we started growing food, and, and my wife Carrie developed this Grow for Health feature with that idea for mine. So this top bar here at the top, you can tap on it, and it will display 26 different health conditions here in this list. And you can scroll through that list, we've got all sorts of different stuff, ranging from diabetes to heart health to the keto diet, uh, mental health, all sorts of stuff, and whenever you choose a, choose one of those, it will filter the plants list down to the plants that help with that condition. So, if you're looking to start growing food, you're not sure where to start, that's a great place to start, is find the reasons why you'd want to grow and then start there. And then, then uh, with an additional filter, at the bottom, you can tap on it, and now this shows you, you can tap on can be planted. So this shows you everything that can be planted indoors or outdoors right now, where you are, it's related to why you want to grow. So this gives you a good list to start from. And then you can go, for, go from there to see what you want to start growing. So we're going to have additional filters coming soon that guide you through knowing what's easiest to grow, what grows best where you are, stuff like that. Um, are there any questions before I move on to any of the tabs or sections? Any? Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, past question. Go ahead. Squash bugs, yes. Uh, I always end up talking about squash bugs, so let's let's jump and talk about them. So squash bugs, unfortunately, once they get started, it is very difficult to eradicate them. So with squash bugs, it all comes down to prevention. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do that. One is through companion planting, like I mentioned earlier, planting herbs around them. Specifically, I believe yarrow is one that has really helped, but any type of rosemary, oregano, anything like that around the squash plant, um, and the way that we grow squash too to help is to grow it vertically. So when, you, when it lays out on the ground, it's really easy for the squash bugs to hide and to get, and, and it's hard for other predators to find them. But if you plant squash, like a zucchini or something like that, next to a T-post, and then as it grows, just attach it to the T-post every six inches, it'll stay that way. Now the plant's up off the ground, and the squash bugs aren't going to be as likely to choose that squash plant because there's nowhere for them to hide as easy. It's easier for bugs to get them, it's easier for you to get them. Um, I pay my, my kids a quarter for every squash bug nest they find, like little <laughs> eggs. That, help, that really works for like a month until they get bored. Um, uh, squash bugs, uh, again, it, it, it all comes down to prevention. So you've got to go out there and check those leaves every day or two um, to see if you have the little sacks of eggs. These right here. But it's usually when we go on vacation. Yes, I know. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing you can do with squash bugs is you can plant a trap crop in the spring. So what that means is pretty much right now, you can probably go ahead and try and risk it, of putting a, um, a really fast producing squash out, like a really fast zucchini. Get it in the ground now. You're not gonna grow this to, it's okay if it gets frozen and dies, we'll try again. The whole point of this is we wanna get a squash plant about six weeks old and get all the squash bugs attracted to it and get them all in one place and make that the only squash you plant. And now once you think, so once they've gathered there, and don't let them lay eggs. You gotta get the adults gathering there, okay? And then as soon as you get one or two adults there, um, then as soon as you see the eggs, now it's time to chop that squash plant off, throw it in a fire with all of them on it, and you can laugh maniacally at them. It's a really therapeutic thing to do, <laughs> believe it or not, at least for me. And, um, and then just would go back in that area where the squash plant was, you can put diatomaceous earth down, although it doesn't work on adult squash bugs, but it will work on the nymphs, 
and you can also do some sort of like soap spray and just really like get that area really good and then hopefully you got the overwintering ones and then it's a matter of time until the other ones find you but that's those are some things you can do to help um, unfortunately I don't have a great just like do this and it works every time solution that's just and then sometimes you got to take a year off from squash last year we pretty much took a year off from squash because they were just everywhere it was hard and we were doing vacations and home garden shows on the weekend so we just couldn't couldn't keep up with it so with that idea in mind let's jump to the pest tab so I showed you earlier, this is the critters tab. The pest list that I showed you earlier were plant or pests that were specific to that plant that we were looking at. This critters tab shows you all the pests across the entire app. So right now you scroll through and you can look at the pests. We have pictures of, sometimes there's different types of, of that. So like for flea beetles, it shows you both types. Sometimes we show you the larva and the adult of it. It just kind of depends on what it is. Uh, and another feature that we're working on is one that lets you take a picture of a pest and it will tell you what it is automatically. So we have that working, but we don't have a database of pests yet. And there's a lot of bugs in the world, so it takes a long time to get that built. So um, we're working on that, and that's something that we're hoping to release again with as part of the Garden Plus that we're doing. And with that, idea, with that idea in mind, what we're wanting to do with this is make it to where when you take a picture of a pest and report it, uh, anyone within 50 miles of you or a given radius is notified that, hey, there was a cucumber beetle spotted, spotted near you you might want to go check your cucumbers. So we can all work together to report pests and to, and to keep issues. Um, another tab we have in here in the Critters tab is the Beneficials tab. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of, uh, a lot of things can help you in the garden. These are, these are a list of those things that can help. So, and it tells you, again, how to attract these. So how to attract butterflies and how to attract different things like that into your garden. Um, I want to show too, so I didn't mention this earlier, but on each plant, when you go to it. So let me go to spinach, because that is something that we are growing right now, and I love to grow, it's one of my favorite things. So when you go to a plant, we also have this more tab on the far right. And whenever you tap on it, this pulls in all of the blog posts and videos that we post on our website. So we have new blog posts and videos going up pretty much every day on our website, and this pulls them in, but this pulls them the ones that are specific to that plant. So these are all the things that have something to do with spinach in some way, shape, or form because they have that tag on it. So, so th this is the way we built the app so that um, it's constantly being updated every single day with information from our garden. Uh, Carrie is always coming up with new recipes for what we're pulling out of the garden and she's constantly finding new stuff and, and cool stuff to put out there. Uh, we have a lot of this too in the learning tab. Um, I believe in the version of the app that's out there now, it's called videos, but this pulls in all of our videos here uh, from YouTube and you can go look at all of those. And uh, we also have a blog post tab, and we're gonna be adding, adding more sections in, into those as well. Um, I do wanna mention as well, we have a store in the app. In the top right, there's a store icon. And this is where you can see, uh, we have all the products from Burpee that we pull into here. So we have things like um, greenhouses and accessories and fertilizers and all sorts of things that you can, you can pull in and look at. And they have a really, uh, they have a, uh, especially as, uh, with pest control, they have a lot of things I've never seen before until we partner with them. Like, uh, this cucumber beetle trap, like that one specifically, I'd been making cucumber beetle traps, but I'd never seen one somewhere else until I saw some of this. So this is a good section to go look at for some innovative solutions for how to handle pests. Um, we also have shirts and things like that. Uh, again, this app is completely free. Uh, we still have day jobs. Uh, we're software developers during the day. My wife teaches nursing at OU. Um, so this is what we do in our, in our spare time, if you have that, but we would love to do this full time so you can help us get to there by telling your friends about it, uh, using links in the app to buy things. We get a small percentage of all the purchases. Um, and then when Garden Plus comes out, that is going to be a monthly premium feature. So um, let me look at what else we need to cover here. Um, let me talk about the Getting Started tab here for a second. So if you're just started out with growing food, if you're just starting, this Getting Started tab here walks you through all the different steps related to growing food. So one common question we get is what soil mix we use. And we've got it broken down in here. We tell you how you can make your own soil mix and save money. We've got solutions in here for automated watering, for all sorts of things. Um, and I wanna talk about these smart pots too. So we're gonna be giving out smart pots here in just a few minutes now. If you don't have a ticket, grab one from Patrick. Um, but we, when we first started growing food, we started with the raised beds that we've got here that you see. And these are starting to all fall apart now. And that was still, so we're four years into it. And the smart pots that we got around the same time are doing fine. And I wish that from the beginning we would have just done these because um, I, I really like these for a number of reasons. Number one, they're portable. 
So like obviously I brought it to the home and garden show. This is from my backyard. This has been out my back in my porch all winter. I picked it up, brought it here to show y'all. Um, this is my rosemary that's been the back porch all, 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 um, all winter long. So that's one thing that's really nice about it is it's portable. But also because these sides are breathable, air is able to come into the sides. That's really important for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with containers when you've grown in them and they've circled and they've got root bound. Once that happens, those roots are useless. They're not doing anything. Um, and that plant is gonna eventually die or it's, it's not gonna be as healthy as it could be. In these containers, whenever, whenever roots hit the side, they don't spiral like that. They stop and they form a bunch of tiny little roots and they continue to pull in oxygen. So um, the, the way these got started is in the tree industry. Whenever they were growing for, uh, trees for uh, nurseries they wanted to transplant out, they would have these big trees that would be root bound, they transplant them, they die, they have unhappy customers. Well, these solve that problem by making it for the transplant them up to 10 years after, after they're planted in these. So um, we started with these, like I mentioned, that, that, that first year, and, and I've really been impressed with them. We've also seen noticeable differences in growth in plants that have planted in these uh, and it compared to, to the, the raised beds here. And um, it baffled me at first, but I, I spent some time digging into the science, and, and really it comes down to the fact that the extra air is coming in to the plants Plants normally only get air from the top, right? In fact, they're getting air from the side. It's like a car. If you're familiar with a supercharger, you pump extra air into the motor, it's gonna go faster, right? It has more power. But at the same time, it requires more gas. So with that idea in mind, you gotta water these a little bit more than I gotta water those. But the way that we've uh, come to water pretty much all of these is what we'll do is we'll take these seven gallon smart pots or the five gallon or, or those smaller sizes basically, and we will put several of them inside of a, a kiddie pool and then fill that kiddie pool with a couple inches of water and then it drinks from below and it makes it really easy to water especially in the summer now especially i want to make sure i mention here don't do too much water if you do the whole kiddie pool then the roots are never going to dry out they're going to it's not good for them either you want to drill a hole in the kiddie pool like two inches up if you're going to leave them in there but what we'll do is i'll kind of rotate them so i'll have two or three kiddie pools set up I've got 20 or 30 of these in my backyard at this point, and I'll just kind of go through and put it in there and then let it sit there for a day, and I'll move that one out and move another one in. I'm kind of always shuffling them around, and that's how I keep them watered. And some things, like rosemary, doesn't like a lot of water, so it doesn't go in there very often, but my tomatoes live in there, basically. So um, that's a really convenient way to grow, and um, let's go ahead and start giving some of these away. So we've got a couple different sizes we're giving to give away. We've got these seven-gallon smart pots here. These are great for pretty much if you want to grow one of something, this is a great size to put it in. Um, probably not a tomato or a big squash plant. You probably want to do a little bit larger size for one of those. But um, these are great, especially for portability. So we've got three of these to give away, and let's draw some tickets here. First one is 326. Plus three digits. We have a winner. Awesome. 332. Got a winner over here. And 330. <laughs> All right. How long has your rosemary been in there? This rosemary is probably two years in this one. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I go through, I, I had 10 rosemary last year and five of them died, so it's hard for me to remember which I ones were what. Yeah, um, as far as rosemary is concerned, and we're going to be doing talks over at our booth, by the way, all day that goes in detail on herbs, but rosemary, the art variety, uh, is the one that tends to be the most hardy around here. Bill Ferris, that's with us over there, does the trials for OSU on rosemary. And he's got a lot of different varieties out of his place. And he's been doing trials the past four years. And ARP has been the, the one that survived the most. But with rosemary and with all herbs in general, keeping them alive through the winter comes down to two, comes down to two things. One is, is make sure you still water them. Don't forget to water them. Um, every two weeks or so, give them a good, you know, thorough wa uh, watering. And then two is whenever we get these cold snaps that come through, they do okay if the temperatures go gradually down and gradually back up, but when we have this like 70, zero, 70, zero, <laughs> these crazy segments, they struggle with that. So if you can just throw a blanket over them on those days that we have the snaps, that'll get them through and they'll be fine. So if you do those two things, you'll have higher success. I'm just lazy and forget to do it and um, I'll leave them out. And, yeah, so. <laughs> All right, so now we've got these 15 gallon smart pots. So. These, um, you could start, so for these, I've, I've, I've uh, seen a lot of people put um, four or five herbs in one of these, and especially this having a handle makes it easy to transport around. It's great for that, um, but it's also great for growing potatoes. 
because whenever you go to harvest, you just dump it out, and then you can go through and pick them up, and the kids especially love doing that. So we really love growing these, uh, pretty much all, anything this size in our backyard has become either for potatoes or sweet potatoes at this point. All right, so the first winner we have is 337. Okay, 313. Got a winner. We got one more, I believe, of that size. 315. Got another winner right here. Patrick's has it. that one? Yeah. Okay. And then, all right, so this one is a 20 gallon smart pot. Uh, just more potatoes, basically. Same thing I said last time. <laughs> and this one goes to 329. Got a winner. All right, and last we have a Big Bag Bed Junior. So this is one of the big smart pots. We've got 12 of these throughout our yard, and these are really great for doing a mix of things, if you want to have a huge bag of lettuce greens, maybe like a salsa garden, for so everything you need for salsa, or an herb garden, it's great for all of those. This one goes to 336. It does not go to 336. 334. All right, we've got a winner. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming out. If you have any specific questions about anything you want to know more about, um, feel free to stick around and ask them. We're going to be at our booth all day um, doing classes. Bill Ferris is doing a class at 1 o'clock about native plants that grow really well here in Oklahoma. Uh, he's an expert on that topic. And then uh, we also have smart pots for sale. If you didn't win one, uh, we have them for sale, for sale over there. Uh, we have links to our app. And then Carrie and I are going to be doing classes all throughout the day where we're just going to be talking about um, we're going to go through as many plants as we can and talk about how we grow it and then how we cook with it and what we do with it and we're just going to spitball for a few hours. So we're going to start all that at our booth, uh, starting at 1 o'clock with Bill and then Carrie and I will start at 2. What size, what size is tomato? Tomato, I would do a tomato. So I, I, I do tomatoes in either a like a, a 10 gallon smart pot. Um, or I will, I, I've, I've been experimenting doing the five gallons in the kiddie pool. So I've been trying to push my lips, my lips to see how, but the thing about tomatoes is the larger smart pot you have, the more room for air you have. So I would recommend doing a 10 to 15 just to be on the safe side or doing like one of the, one of these sizes or something like that and then surround it with basil. And really that's the thing with tomato is always surround it with basil because it helps improve the flavor, it helps keep pests away. Um, and it's, it's a great companion for it. So, so that's what I would do with tomatoes, is something like this in the middle and then have it around and surrounded by other stuff. This one is, yes, yeah. And with tomatoes too, you can lay them down, like when you plant them, you can lay them vertically and then they'll produce roots all along that, so you get more root area. So especially in something like this, I would do that. And for tomatoes, I would probably do one of the larger, big bad bad juniors, a little bit larger than this many. Yes? Is now the time to plant spinach? Spinach, it's a little late to plant spinach. Uh, we, well, but it's, it's like a week too late, so go ahead, like try it. What's the worst that could happen? You may just have, you'll probably, you, you won't get as many rounds off of it as you would if you did earlier, but. Lettuce. Lettuce is faster, so you'll have better success with it. So I tried putting lettuce in the big pot last year, the uh -huh. What what time of year was it when you planted? When when was it? Yeah, it was probably about June. Yeah, lettuce does not like the heat at all. Lettuce does not grow once it gets above eighty. So if you got it, if you if you sowed it in the ground right now, you'd have some at the end of April, and then you've got a week or two of May before it gets too hot and it's gone. But you'll get a little bit of it. So typically, lettuce is uh, February and early March. Should I replenish the soil that's in that? Just add some compost. Add two inches of compost uh, on the top. Uh, you can get compost from uh, Markham's Nursery, has a really good compost. Uh, there's also uh, Minic Materials, has some really good compost as well. That's where I get my compost from, is the, stuff, the compost I made. Uh, what's the name of your website? Uh, it's called From Seed to Spoon. I've got a card here I can give you that has all the information. And we have a YouTube channel and Facebook. I have and a card from your booth. Awesome. I want to go backwards. Yeah. Planted tomato plant sideways. Yeah, so the way, so the tomato plant, okay? So, those little hairs that are all on tomato, each one of those will become a root if it's in the soil. 
So uh, not every plant is like this, but tomatoes are a plant that is like this. So the way you can plant it is dig a hole that's kind of like at an angle, like this, mm -hmm. and then you lay it in there and you lay it over, and then you put the dirt on top of it, and then you kind of kind of angle it back up a little bit, and then the sun will naturally pull it. Yeah, yeah. So then you end up with more root area, basically. Um, yeah, now you got to make sure, the, the one consideration to take here though, is that the leaves don't touch the soil. So you got to pick all the leaves off that make it, because that's, that's how the plant gets diseases. The diseases live in the soil, rain splashes up on the plant, so that's a way you can help with that. And mulch will help keep that from happening too. Is this big enough to keep the plant in? You could, but I wouldn't. I would do a Big Bad Bed Junior or like a 15 gallon, like they're, they're taller. Like I would do something like this, like that's, that's see how it's taller? Two tomatoes? No, no. It'll be fine with one. Surround it with basil. Mm -hmm. yep. Very good. Why do you surround it with basil? So basil is a great companion plant. Um, the way pests find what they're looking for is through smell. So if you have uh, a tomato plant, for example, the, the pests that are looking for tomato are, are smelling it out. So if you have a bunch of basil around the tomato, it makes it hard for them to find it. And basil also improves the flavor of tomatoes. It's, they've been growing together for a long time, and they just um, they do really well together. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's a natural pairing, and once you like, learn this, you start to see other pairings of foods that have gone together for a long time. Well, there's a reason why, they, why they're typically eaten together, because they grow really well together. Yes, here's a card for our app here. We have a free app that is on iPhone and Android, and uh, from Seed and Spin, yeah. And we have a YouTube channel. And we, we're just starting to sell them. Really, we're a software company, that's what we're, but we started, we have a lot of people that download the